Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman. And even though we're recording right in the thick of grading, aka every professor's least favorite time of year, I propose we start off today's episode by thinking sunshiny thoughts in the sorting chat. Hannah, I want to talk about summer and specifically... I want you to tell me about your favorite tasty summer treats. Oh, okay. Marcel, I am so glad you asked because (laughs) there is a thing that I have been just thinking of and longing for as I like mentally project myself forward to an imaginary summer when the weather is beautiful and it's my, like I'm taking time off and we're all vaccinated and <laughs> life is good. And that mm-hmm. image is the concession stand at Jericho <laughs> Beach. Okay, tell me about this. Jericho Beach is one of the beaches in Vancouver. I say one of the beaches because we have many. Yes, the city is amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jericho Beach is my favorite beach. It's like a little further off the beaten path, so it tends to be a little less busy. One time I was swimming there and a seal swam by. Shut up. Just like, just like, (laughs) I was just like, that's cool and also scary. Wow. But the best thing about Jericho Beach is the concession stand because the concession stand has Mm -hmm. both veggie dogs and vegan ice cream. Oh, oh. It rolls. That's that's the most Vancouver thing I've ever heard. It absolutely rules. It's so Vancouver, and there is nothing more satisfying. It's quite a bike ride from me. It's over an hour bike ride to get from where I live to Jericho Beach. So it's like hot day, like long, sweaty bike ride. And then you get there, and you like strip down to your bathing suit and go for a swim in the cold ocean, and then have a veggie dog and a (laughs) scoop of vegan ice cream. Like, Literally name a better thing to do. You can't because I mean, that it's the best. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah. What about you? What are your favorite summer treats? Oh gosh. Um so I I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. I'm not typically a person who enjoys sweets very often. What a lie. Well, <laughs> it's a lie when I'm pregnant. <laughs> Fair enough, but fair enough. You are more of a more of a chips gal. I'm a little salty, you might say. <laughs> um, and, and so generally, like, I don't go out of my way to acquire things like ice cream mm-hmm. when I could instead acquire a poutine, for example. Gotcha, gotcha. But there's something about... Oh, wow, this is going to sound really... This is a hot take. There's something about warm weather that makes me enjoy a nice cool treat (laughs) (laughs) this is the kind of cutting edge think outside the box commentary (laughs) that the people come to this podcast for this Mm -hmm. is the kind of Mm counterintuitive radical thinking Mm -hmm. that really makes feminist critique worthwhile (laughs) so so recently (laughs) An H Mart opened in Edmonton. I say recently because I don't know when it opened, but it wasn't there when we moved here, and it was there when we drove past it not that long ago and decided. Has to say an H Mart. So I believe that an H Mart is a sort of mainstream North American owned Asian grocery store. Gotcha. So like TNT. Like TNT, yeah. But like North American bougie kind of okay all right i think it's owned by loblaws but i'm not i'm not positive about that but i i'm i'm pretty sure that it is owned by like a north american conglomerate or something anyway so i went to an h mart for the first time and as often happens when i go into a new grocery store i am swept away by the various Mm -hmm. treat opportunities that lie before (laughs) me (laughs) and i bought a box of I believe it was called 
brown sugar boba ice cream sickles <laughs> or something like that. And holy moly, I'm just really living for these right now. I'm They're... so I'm so glad. <laughs> I need to go back to the H Mart. <laughs> you really do. You need to stock up. I do. Fill your freezer. We have a deep Ooh. freezer, thank goodness. And so I think I need to buy a case. Yeah, you absolutely do. <laughs> buy so many that I eventually hate them. <laughs> That's the only way. That's how I like to do it. <laughs> There's something you find that you like. The only answer is to overconsume it until you hate it. Precisely. Yes. Great. <laughs> That's Great. how you plan well, for the future, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's snowing in Edmonton right now. Oh, it but is. <laughs> I, I wish you warm days to come to heighten your frozen treat enjoyment. Thank you. That means so much. (laughs) Summer may be just around the corner, but we've got some final exams to get through first, which means it's time for revision. So this is the segment where we summarize pertinent conversations that we've had and sort of draw them into the new episode. And since we're going to be talking a lot about Lupin today, I think we should start off with a quick refresher on how we already talked about him as a character Mm -hmm. in our most recent two episodes. A great idea, Hannah. Love this. So far, we've talked about Lupin through the frame of animal studies and disability studies. From the perspective of animal studies, we focused on how the power to define someone as human or not human is entangled with other structures of power, including the dehumanization inherent in racism. We looked at how Lupin's liminal status as both human and non-human marks him as less than in the eyes of the larger wizarding world, aligning him with other not-quite-human characters, including house elves, goblins, centaurs, and even Hagrid. Then, in our conversation with Taya Gerbeza, we talked about reading werewolfism, or as we will sometimes call it in this episode, lycanthropy, such a good word, lycanthropy, as disability or chronic illness. So we talked about how the failure in the wizarding world to regularly provide werewolves with reasonable accommodations, like the wolf's bane potion, can be read as an example of the social rather than medical model of disability. Mm -hmm. That is the way that uh, structural ableism is, in fact, sort of more limiting and harmful than the disability itself. Mm -hmm. And Taya also introduced us to the scholarship of Renee Ward and Ruth Analik, who have both looked at the history of werewolves in literature. So Ward explains that werewolves have historically been treated as markers of otherness and difference, while Analik points out that the gothic trope of the monstrous other, including the werewolf, um, often signifies the desire to exclude non-normative bodies from society. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how werewolves in particular signify this kind of a hidden threat or like an invisible pathology. You Mm. sort of look at a werewolf most of the month and you cannot Mm -hmm. perceive their werewolfism, but that that invisible pathology ultimately reveals itself, right? It comes Mm -hmm. out when the moon is full and it reveals itself as not only monstrous, but actively dangerous. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how uh, because of ableist society's obsession with cure, the incurability of lycanthropy is particularly horrifying. Yeah, with all these interpretations of Lupin as other established, you might be wondering why we are revisiting him again in this episode. And the reason is because we have yet to grapple with one of the most significant ways werewolves in the Harry Potter series have been discussed, and that is as a metaphor for HIV and AIDS. In order to explain the significance of this metaphor in particular, we're going to take a deep dive into the whole concept of metaphor and its relationship to illness. But before we do that, we need a little bit more context on what our favorite author has said. Lycanthropy? Lycanthropy? Lycanthropy. Lycanthropy or lycanthropy? I don't know. I think it's a lycanthrope and lycanthropy. A lycanthrope? Is that a person who 
likes werewolves. No, it's not. <laughs> I think that would be a lycanthropophile. <laughs> yes. Oh, right, because misanthrope is a person. Who, anyway, okay. Oh, my God. I love that uh, misanthrope anyway. is a person who hates people and a lycanthrope is a person who likes people. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. But before we do that, we need a little more context on what the author, J.K. Rowling herself, has said about lycanthropy in relation to HIV and AIDS. So this interpretation of werewolfism as a metaphor for HIV and AIDS comes specifically from Rowling. It it is an interpretation she has stated on record multiple times. But Mm -hmm. its sort of most established version is one of Rowling's many ill-advised additions to her fantasy world uh, (laughs) published on Pottermore. That's really, things really started taking a downhill slide when Pottermore was launched. What a cursed sight. Uh, anyway, so one of the ebooks published on Pottermore is called Short Stories from Hogwarts of Heroism, Hardship, and Dangerous Hobbies. And this is the story that arguably makes this interpretation of werewolfism as a metaphor for HIV and AIDS canon, because it's like a published text in the Harry Potter world. Mm-hmm. I am not totally convinced that the Pottermore stuff is anything more than like sanctioned bad fan fiction mm-hmm. that Rowling is writing about her own books. But mm-hmm. that is the topic of canonicity and its relationship to paratext is a conversation <laughs> for another day. I've seen people liken her tendency to do this to George Lucasing. They've yes. said, like, J.K. Rowling is George Lucasing her <laughs> her wizard universe. Anyway, yeah. sorry, continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people George Lucas when they are mad that fans have taken control of the meaning of a cultural text. <laughs> so... That's that's fine. Anyway, let me read what Rowling writes about Lupin in that Please piece. Please do. Mm-hmm. Quote, Lupin's condition of lycanthropy was a metaphor for those illnesses that carry a stigma, like HIV and AIDS. All kinds of superstitions seem to surround bloodborne conditions, probably due to taboos surrounding blood itself. The wizarding community is as prone to hysteria and prejudice as the muggle one, and the character of Lupin gave me a chance to examine those attitudes. End quote. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. She also gives the backstory to how Lupin contracted lycanthropy. He was bitten as a child by a werewolf who wanted revenge on his father. So in this reading, Lupin's story becomes one of being intentionally given a bloodborne illness as a child by a dangerous man, mm-hmm. being haunted by the stigma of that illness throughout his life, and struggling to live in a society that fears him, and that to some degree is right to fear him, because he is constantly at risk of transferring his illness to the children under his care. Mm. Now, Marcel, tell me, I feel instinctively how this metaphor is troubling. Mm hmm. Uh, but I would love to have some theory to help me understand my deep, intuitive discomfort. Yes, you are right to feel that way. And I am very pleased to have some theory ready to go. So let's turn to that section now. (laughs) If I had the power to transform things, I would definitely turn right now into July. That's how transfiguration works, right? I'll find out for certain in Transfiguration Class, the segment where we talk theory to you. Okay. So we're going to talk about metaphor. Mm, I'm ready. Let's start with every elementary school English definition of a metaphor. A metaphor is a comparison between two things without using like or as. Okay. So that basically sounds like metaphors are just similes minus the conjunctions. Exactly. But that's not at all how metaphors work. Um, In literature, as a discipline, metaphors are way more interesting and, I dare say, downright magical. 
Incredible. So in the context of a story or poem or play, for example, metaphors allow for the transformation of one thing into another. It's not just a figure of speech, but a new way of seeing the world. Oh, oh, it's like real life transfiguration. It is. Amazing. So (laughs) even outside literature, we see metaphors structuring culture in all kinds of ways, like the tendency among white people to reduce the systemic issue of police brutality to, quote, one bad apple, unquote. These aren't just expressions, they're they're ideologies that say something about the reality people are constructing. Mm Mm-hmm, exactly. Social and cultural metaphors are so pervasive that Susan Sontag, who we'll come back to in a moment, writes that, quote, one cannot think without metaphors, end quote. Now, Mm. Is this true of everyone on an individual scale? I mean, probably not, but it is definitely true of me. And it's (laughs) certainly one of the ways that ideologies circulate in our society. Yeah, I mean, I think we could we could talk about, you know, the way we've discussed discourse, Mm -hmm. discourse as the language that enacts ideologies and Mm -hmm. makes them real. And like discourse is always kind of metaphorical, right? Totally. Yes. And it's always a sort of an attempt to replace the real conditions, real lived conditions of reality with language. Mm -hmm. Um, Language often meant intentionally to like distract us from Mm -hmm. what's actually going on. Exactly. Or to reshape it in some way Mm. or another. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, much like magic, metaphors can be used for good and righteous purposes. I can't think of an example. <laughs> but, you know, well, we, you know, we, th- we, hear, we hear about this with things like science fiction, right? That it's an mm-hmm. opportunity to defamiliarize oppressive ideologies by reconstructing them in a new way. I mean, poetry, right? Like so Mm -hmm. much of poetry is about making language strange Mm -hmm. in order to show us how it's working. And that's, you know, you can look at so much of the like radical world changing poetry being written by black and indigenous poets today. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely about like seizing metaphor and making language strange in a way that is exposing how it's been used harmfully and like reversing that. Yes. That there's a wonderful Chantal Gibson's poetry collection, How She Read, mm-hmm. is exactly about this. Super good. We'll put a link in our show notes. And again, like magic, we can see that metaphors can be used for nefarious purposes, like reinforcing mm. oppressive systems of power. The one bad apple metaphor that you mentioned, Hannah, is a perfect example of this. Mm. What we see with Rowling's use of lycanthropy as a metaphor for HIV is, to be generous, <laughs> a failed... Yeah, by all means, be generous. <laughs> you know I, you know I, I do. <laughs> mm. It is a failed attempt at defamiliarization. As one of my favorite metaphors goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> So Rowling might have meant well, but using lycanthropy as a metaphor for HIV brutally reinforces the very stigma that she sought to unpack. And her representation of Lupin altogether omits any of the valuable counter narratives that emerged out of HIV positive communities. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's... It is not metaphor itself that is a problem, but what you do with it, as is the case with so many things. And when all you do with it Mm -hmm. is reinforce stigma, then then your metaphor has not been particularly useful. So to use one of our favorite metaphors here at Witch Please, let's make sure we're all on the same page about how the medical and cultural meanings of HIV and AIDS have changed over the last 20 years. Yes. Always a great idea, Hannah. So first things first. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. This is a virus that weakens your immune system. It's also the virus that can lead to AIDS. But AIDS isn't just one thing. So the acronym stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. And a syndrome 
is a cluster of symptoms. So a person diagnosed with HIV does not necessarily have and may never get AIDS. And AIDS is a clinical diagnosis based on the status of your immune system. So medical speak, generally it's when your CD4 T cell count, (laughs) your CD4 T cell count falls under 200, or when you acquire and there's the acquired, when you acquire certain infections that your body would otherwise be able to prevent. Huh. That was a really helpfully <laughs> clear explanation. Thank you. I wrote it. <laughs> it's almost like you have worked in this field. Oh, ages ago. But by golly, does it come in useful. <laughs> so we're not doing a medical episode, though. The way we're going to talk about HIV and AIDS will reflect what and how these terms mean in our society. So Mm. specifically, we're talking about the terms as metaphors. So I might refer to AIDS as an illness or a disease because that's how it's understood culturally, even though it's literally not a disease, but a group of symptoms which could include diseases such as cancer. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes sense. Okay, great. All right. So for this segment, I have drawn on Susan Sontag's work, AIDS and Its Metaphors, which is a companion to her earlier book, Illnesses Metaphor. Amazing. So I've read Illnesses Metaphor, but I've never read AIDS and Its Metaphors. So I am excited to learn more. Okay. Published in 1989, AIDS and Its Metaphors examines, as the title suggests, the metaphors that dominated the way we in North America understood HIV and AIDS at the time. So the book was published at a time when AIDS was desperately misunderstood and when paranoia about transmission was high, like really irrationally high, and when the life expectancy of someone diagnosed with HIV was around only about 10 years. So it's like right in the height of the AIDS epidemic. Yes, So in 1989, treatment had only been available for about two years. It was really expensive, and it had a lot of side effects, and it was not nearly as effective as what's available today. And so in light of all of this, the public perception of HIV and AIDS was both fearful and sensationalized, and this is the culture that Sontag is responding to with the book AIDS and Its Metaphors. Yeah, this makes perfect sense, too, because like she'd already established in illness as metaphor, this sort of larger critical interest in how contemporary discourse around illnesses, like how quickly illnesses get turned into metaphors, right? Mm -hmm. That basic idea. And in that first book, she's talking about tuberculosis Mm -hmm. and cancer and the sort of these different historical moments where these diseases or illnesses like have held a great deal of cultural weight. Yes. So I'm I'm really interested to hear more about what she sort of did with the cultural weight of HIV and AIDS. Yeah. So she's very much building off of illness as metaphor in this mm-hmm. companion piece. Um, to begin, Sontag explains that the metaphors for HIV and AIDS, as well as these other illnesses like cancer and tuberculosis, also syphilis and Mm. the plague, (laughs) that they depend on, quote, the perennial description of society as a kind of body, a well-disciplined body ruled by a head, end quote. Mm. Oh, gosh, I'm only I'm only realizing right in this moment how pertinent this conversation is going to be for the fact that we're all living through a global epidemic. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's really, really some overlapping concerns here. Yes, absolutely. And because we're focusing on lycanthropy, we won't even really get into a lot of the ways that her analysis is so pertinent and so relevant to today. But it is. So, you know, if... If you're interested, I highly recommend give it a read. Yeah. So before we even get to, you know, metaphors for disease, she's arguing that we have to understand the metaphor used to define society itself. And that mm-hmm. metaphor is like society is a body, it's ruled by a head. 
Yes, yes, precisely. Cool. And society as body ruled by head is a very old metaphor. Um, okay. It might sound familiar if you ever studied Macbeth. Uh, the <laughs> idea is that if the king or ruler is illegitimate, then that illegitimacy will wreak havoc on the subjects. Mm. So in Macbeth, the title character becomes king through murder most foul, rather than through the so-called proper lines of succession. And pretty soon, it's all bad weather and horses eating each other. I'm sorry, horses eat each other in Macbeth? Yeah. Okay, so society as body ruled by head, corrupted head can corrupt the body. Mm -hmm. The reverse is likewise imagined to be true. So a healthy and disciplined society body can be mm -hmm. invaded and corrupted until its head, which is, I guess, the government, is no longer in control. Sontag points out that, quote, disease is regularly described as invading society, whereas efforts to reduce mortality are called a fight, a struggle, a war. So we see here how the language of national security is used to shape popular metaphors about illness. Mm. But, but what is particularly sinister about using the metaphor of war, Sontag explains, is that the representation of the disease as a, quote, alien other inevitably leads to blaming the patient for contracting the disease in the first place. Oh my God, we see so much of this in so many places, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that is that is fascinating. I mean, we see it with cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Losing your fight with cancer, mm -hmm. which is so often framed as like a form of weakness. We 100% mm -hmm. see it with stigma around AIDS. Mm -hmm. We see it with, with the spread of the pandemic, right? The mm -hmm. like fixation on individual responsibility. Like mm -hmm. there is so much this desire to like individualize and blame people for becoming ill. Exactly. And Sontag is saying that that comes directly out of this desire to frame illness through the metaphor of war, because mm -hmm. we might find ourselves inclined to say that the patient or the sufferer was irresponsible. They mm -hmm. let their guard down. They didn't do their part to keep the enemy at bay. Mm -hmm. Loose lips sink ships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so... As you're saying, Hannah, nowhere is this attribution of fault more pronounced than in illnesses seen to be preventable through what we might call lifestyle choices. Yeah, illnesses that perhaps disproportionately affect already stigmatized communities mm -hmm. where the desire to uh, or the ability to frame those who are disproportionately impacted as alien others is already like ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ready and willing. Mm -hmm. So Sontag writes, quote, indeed to get AIDS is precisely to be revealed as a member of a certain risk group, a community of pariahs. The illness fleshes out an identity that might have remained hidden from neighbors job mates, family, and friends, end quote. Mm. So in North America, transmission of HIV was largely concentrated among men who have sex with men and intravenous drug users. Mm -hmm. And because queer sex and injection drug use are already stigmatized, HIV and AIDS could be, and indeed were, framed as the fault of members of those certain risk groups. Mm -hmm. And we continue to see, right, the sort of the recent news about there being successful or promising looking HIV vaccines mm -hmm. that came out of the RNA vaccine technology developed for COVID, mm -hmm. which is like people were not as motivated yes. to come up with a vaccine for an illness that continues to disproportionately impact men who have sex with men, intravenous drug users, and Black people. Yes, exactly. So compounding the stigma was the fact that in the 1980s and 1990s, AIDS was also a fairly visible illness. Mm. So um, in the first decade of treatment, um, HIV meds 
could really wreak havoc on the body. The most visible side effect uh, being something called lipodystrophy, which is a redistribution of the body's fat storage and a change in the way that the body produces fat. And so it would create these sort of visible markers of Mm -hmm. somebody who was taking antiretroviral treatment. Gotcha. So what this meant is that the so-called visible markers of AIDS were then replaced with the visible markers of treatment. And this allowed the stigma to remain unchanged. Gotcha. And we get lots of popular culture sort of pinpoints. Like I think of, is it Tom Hanks in Mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, right? Who becomes this like, what does somebody who is sick with AIDS look like? Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of, right? Like visibly marked as ill, Mm -hmm. also white and male like there's lots of there's lots of sort of things going on but but we see how sort of cultural representations of illness play into how we then read that illness Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's right and so thanks to major advances in treatment by the late 1990s um, hiv was really becoming a, a manageable chronic condition and the new classes of drug therapies in the aughts really drastically reduced the physiological side effects. And so Mm -hmm. this meant that starting around, you know, the early aughts, HIV status could actually remain private. Well, it could remain relatively private. And I say relatively because there are still countries that you can't enter if you're carrying HIV AIDS medications. And it wasn't actually that long ago that the U.S. was among them. Um, The law changed in 2010. I remember this because there was a huge HIV AIDS conference and people were like, hi, we can't come to your conference because we can't be guaranteed to get through the border with our medication. So, yeah. Um, Wow. 2010, not that long ago. So while stigma and misinformation around HIV persists, its transformation into a manageable chronic condition has meant that a lot of these metaphors that Sontag wrote about in 1989 have transformed too. Yeah, that makes sense. And so like rather than a war on AIDS or the demonization of folks living with HIV, we might begin to see uh, a little bit more uh, commonly emphasis on harm reduction, Mm -hmm. on education and prevention, and most importantly, on the notion of treatment as prevention, which recognizes that folks living with HIV might still want to be sexually active and have Mm -hmm. a right to be. Mm -hmm. So all of these things, in my humble opinion, are great. Yes, And were one inclined to use a Mm -hmm. metaphor to talk about the stigma of Mm -hmm. HIV and AIDS, and were one writing that metaphor in the late 90s or early 2000s, perhaps one might be inclined to draw on the harm reduction, Mm -hmm. sex positivity, (laughs) destigmatization, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Or maybe not. Or maybe one would be inclined to explore the notions of stigma by just writing about stigma without unpacking its social and cultural meaning. So we're ta- we're talking about Lupin, right? Yeah, yeah, we're talking okay, about. Okay, just Lupin. making sure. Yeah, just yeah. making sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's an official transition for you. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. <laughs> In AIDS and its metaphors, Sontag argues that quote. AIDS does not allow romanticizing or sentimentalizing, perhaps because its association with death is too powerful, end quote. So as HIV has become treatable and manageable, I think we've seen exactly that shift towards AIDS as sentimental and romantic, particularly in narratives by folks not living with HIV. And this is where Remus Lupin comes in. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. So he is an example of the like romanticization, sentimentalization that can't possibly be a word, but let's go with it (laughs) of of the sort of metaphor of HIV and AIDS sort of as constructed by somebody with perhaps a lack of deep understanding of the lived experience. Mm hmm. Yes. 
precisely. Okay. Okay. Rowling's use of lycanthropy as a metaphor for HIV relies on the stigma and suffering that were central to the early AIDS metaphors that Sontag describes. Gotcha. And because Rowling has publicly acknowledged this metaphor, lycanthropy in the Harry Potter series thus overtly and covertly reproduces the metaphor of AIDS as a threat to society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So more specifically, lycanthropy in Harry Potter reproduces what Sontag identifies as a kind of us versus them mentality in which Us always refers to this so-called general populace, Mm -hmm. and them always refers to an already stigmatized people. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a couple of quotations. Okay. Okay. So Sontag says, quote, Every feared epidemic disease, but especially those associated with sexual license, generates a preoccupying distinction between the disease's putative carriers and those defined as the general population, end quote. Yes. Yeah. So there's, that's just really interesting. So there's this idea that like the person, the carrier isn't a member of the general population who like became infected. Exactly. It's like they are, they are this, this dangerous other who like brought it into the general population. Yes. Yes, exactly. And this is where quote number two kicks in, which is, okay, quote, From the beginning, the construction of AIDS had depended on notions that separated one group of people from another, this is the them and us, while implying the imminent dissolution of these distinctions. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. This really... (laughs) So on the one hand, we've got the social construction of AIDS that says that people who contract it, the them, did something to Mm -hmm. deserve it. But on the other hand, AIDS can be transmitted to people who don't deserve it, us, Mm -hmm. and thus the us is in danger. Yes, exactly. In Sontag's words, it is a punishment for deviant behavior and it threatens the innocent. Oh, this is so interesting in the case of Lupin. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, (laughs) that seems like like a transparent contradiction. (laughs) Yes, and it should be, but it isn't. And (laughs) Lupin's infection, explained even by Rowling as not his fault, is characteristic of the danger posed to the so-called innocent or the us by the so-called deviants or the them. Mm -hmm. Even the name, oh, this is where it gets really, whoo, it gets really stark here. Even the name of the werewolf who infected Lupin reinforces this contradiction. Fenrir Greyback's name might as well be Fenrir Bareback. And I know that we haven't met him in the series yet, but when we do, he'll be constructed as the polar opposite of Lupin, one who revels in licentiousness and who deliberately spreads his infection to others. Yes, and who particularly targets children. Yes. And, like, the the image of Fenrir Greyback as this, like, monstrous other who is Mm -hmm. always visibly marked as a werewolf and who preys on young boys. Yes. Which is, like, a thing we see in Lupin's backstory. So we've got Fenrir Greyback as the, like, always stigmatized other Mm -hmm. and then Lupin as that like liminal character again who sort of bridges the divide between these these contradicting metaphors where he Mm -hmm. is both a threat to the innocent but Mm -hmm. also himself the innocent who was threatened Mm -hmm. yes yes I want you to hang on to your hat okay okay because I'm gonna bring in another Sontag quote So Sontag reminds us that, quote, the most terrifying illnesses are those perceived not just as lethal, but as dehumanizing, literally so, end quote. The most dreaded, she argues, are alterations of the face, quote, that seem like mutations into animality, end quote. Yep, 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 yep. So Lupin doesn't merely transform 
physically, he loses himself. He becomes his disease when he transforms he into, he is the disease, yeah. right? He is a werewolf. Yes. You aren't just infected with werewolfism. You are a werewolf now. You have changed categories. You are no longer fully human. Exactly. And with Greyback, again, who we haven't met yet, but we can't talk about this without talking about him, Greyback just looks like a werewolf all the time. And this yeah. is supposed to indicate to us what kind of deviant he is. So with Lupin, even as a tragic, romantic figure, his infection necessarily reproduces the associations between HIV transmission and what Sontag calls the dissolution of the person. It mm -hmm. isn't his fault, the novel tells us, but like Fenrir Greyback, he is constructed as a danger to the children at Hogwarts. My goodness, this book sure, <laughs> AIDS and its metaphors sure did turn out to be shockingly pertinent <laughs> to yeah. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, huh? It's like rolling Reddit, but took all the wrong information from it. It's so spot on. And I mean, it's spot on because... Sontag is identifying widespread, uncritically circulated cultural metaphors mm -hmm. and thinking about how they work, whereas Rowling as an author loves to reproduce uncritically mm -hmm. widespread cultural metaphors. And we see that all the way through these texts, right? Yes, Go totally. goblins, goblins as Jews, werewolves mm -hmm. as people with HIV or AIDS like all of these all of these metaphors are just those tropes mm -hmm. right which yeah. are the shorthands of discourses which are the sort of production of ideologies and when you mm -hmm. when you reach for the shorthand to try to signify things to people and you haven't done any thinking about yes. the ideologies behind those kinds of easy shorthands those those tropes and those metaphors you end up just reproducing them Yes, you do. Yeah. I'm sure many of our listeners are themselves also writers. Mm -hmm. Let this be a lesson to us all. <laughs> it's not a metaphor if it doesn't help you see things differently. Oh, ah, so, mm, okay. Well, I think to really get a handle on how this metaphor is operating, mm -hmm. we, should, uh, we should go back to the text for a little bit. This is a great idea. We have just one last hurdle before we can start summer vacation. <gasps> oh, summer vacation. So let's hurry up and write our owls. This is the segment where we dive back into the text and think about how our new theoretical framing helps us understand something we might not have seen before. So let's start with... The first moment when we encounter Lupin. All right. We see him as a character for the first time on the train. Mm -hmm. And what is the very first information we get about him? He's a sweep. <laughs> <laughs> He's a soupy okay. baby. <laughs> okay. What's the second information we get about him? He has tattered robes. He looks impoverished. Here we go. Okay. The stranger was wearing an extremely shabby set of wizard's robes, mm -hmm. which had been darned in several places. He looked ill and exhausted. Mm -hmm. So the moment we encounter him, the physical description that we get of him is he is poor mm -hmm. and he is sick. Yep. And that is what we know about Lupin. Yeah. So in our previous conversations, we've talked about how werewolfism is something that you can hide. And it is because the kids don't know why he looks sickly and weak. So thinking back to like the physiological indicators of AIDS or of HIV treatment, like if you don't know what the mm -hmm. physiological symptoms are, then you don't know why the person looks the way they do, but you still can. So like mm -hmm. in that sense, the illness is a secret. But mm -hmm. once you do know, like once you have a substitute teacher force you to read an entire chapter to out 
his colleague, then all of a sudden the symptoms are visible and they are recognizable and it is no longer a secret. And the secret is a secret that is legible with adequate knowledge. Yes. So if you actually are paying attention, you're like, okay, he's sickly. Um, he gets much more sickly. He disappears mm-hmm. monthly mm-hmm. around the full moon. And when he comes back, he looks worse. Mm-hmm. Uh the fear that emerges, the Bogart transforms into a full moon. He like there are all of these, there are all of these legible clues. So mm-hmm. even though he represents this kind of like anxiety about a pathology that is not visible, mm-hmm. it's not necessarily like immediately legible, mm-hmm. but it's still there, stamped on him. Yeah, and it still can be like detected. And not only can it be detected with adequate scrutiny, but the text encourages us to read Lupin's body as a text Mm -hmm. that needs to be as a riddle Mm -hmm. that needs to be solved. Yes. Right. And And it rewards us. Right. This narrative structure of sort of giving increasingly significant clues until the revelation structurally rewards us Mm -hmm. for like interrogating his secret Mm -hmm. and trying to figure it out and then at the end like knowing the real truth about who he is Mm -hmm. yeah and like this is as though the real truth about who he is is werewolf and not remus lupin excellent professor yes the truth that needs to be unfolded is not a truth about like you know his deep kindness his profound commitment to teaching his it's not even his friendship with harry's dad no it's it's that he's a werewolf yeah yeah it's the illness that has become synonymous with his identity Mm -hmm. so we see in all of these ways Lupin as representation of stigma, right? And and mm-hmm. particularly mm-hmm. stigma around illness. So mm-hmm. he's mm-hmm. harboring the secret. He is dependent on the benevolence of his employer to keep the secret as mm-hmm. well as the benevolence of the employer to provide sick leave, to guarantee access to treatment, because mm-hmm. these are not things that are otherwise available to him. Um, yeah. And even though it's strongly implied by Dumbledore hiring him that his threat to the children is overinflated Mm -hmm. by cultural stigma against werewolfism, Mm -hmm. right? The implication is like, it needs to be a secret because people will overreact. Mm -hmm. And that proves that, you know, is 100% confirmed. The Mm -hmm. second his secret is out, he has to leave. Mm -hmm. So that secret is, is dangerous. But we just, we can't, I cannot overemphasize enough the fact that he does almost kill these kids. Exactly. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like that's, I mean, it's where, it's where the metaphor sort of both falls apart, mm-hmm. but also like reaches its like apex. It's apex. <laughs> yes. Because like it both is like, well, people living with HIV or AIDS don't transform into monsters and bite children Mm -hmm. but like that's the work the metaphors are doing Mm -hmm. is to suggest that that is always a possibility years and years ago when i worked at a drop-in center for people living with hiv when i would tell people that that's what i did the number of absolutely outrageous and ludicrous and inappropriate questions that people would ask me about like whether or not I was afraid that I might contract HIV working with people. And I was like, what do you think we do? Like one, you, you clearly have no idea how this virus is transmitted. And two, Mm -hmm. if you did have an idea, you clearly have no idea what a drop in center involves. Mm -hmm. And so To then sort of take that irrational and misunderstanding of a stigmatized illness and to confirm it or to rationalize it in this novel 
is yeah. really, really fucked up. I like I don't know what the like is that the technical term for it? It's the technical like, term is fucked up, yeah. right? If we return back to that original language from the Pottermore piece, the language of sort of stigma around bloodborne illnesses because of taboos of sort of hysteria existing in in wizarding and muggle communities alike. Mm -hmm. All of that suggests a version of werewolfism that is not actually a danger, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That is taboo and feared because it is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. But that, if correctly understood, would be seen to be... Like, yes, perhaps a a difficult illness to live with, Mm -hmm. but something that, you know, isn't actually a risk to other people that does not meaningfully diminish a person's ability to be a good teacher, to Mm -hmm. be a member of society. But that is not what happens Mm -hmm. in the fucking book. No. What happens is he accidentally and unpredictably transforms and everyone has to flee Mm -hmm. in order to avoid being literally killed by him. Mm -hmm. And as a direct result of the unpredictability and danger of his illness, a terrible prophecy about the return of of Voldemort comes true. Yes. This leads me to, I think, probably my biggest issue with mm-hmm. this representation, which is Lupin's isolation. So yes. exactly as you put it, Hannah, like the implication that this taboo is misguided, but mm-hmm. then the way that the novel is like, but it's actually not misguided. <laughs> it's a good taboo. So this stands out to me because it directly reproduces the notion of the HIV positive person as an isolated and cast out member of society, right? Mm -hmm. That this is warranted because they they could, even if they don't mean to, be a danger. Yeah. Okay. So the thing that really grinds my gears, to use another (laughs) metaphor. (laughs) Good metaphor. Is the fact that this representation completely ignores the activism and the drive of the early HIV positive communities. So Mm -hmm. like, as well as agitating for access to treatment and for rights and for protections, folks living with HIV and their allies also formed communities to support one another, to, to provide resources to each other. Like if your goal in this text is to unpack and problematize stigma, where is the werewolf community supporting one another through like recipe exchanges for wolfsbane potions? Like where is Lupin's support group? Why is it that like Lupin is the only good werewolf in the entire wizarding world and all of the others are like monstrous underground creatures out to harm people? I <laughs> Children, specifically. Children, specifically. Specifically, out to get children. Like, what a <sighs> symptom of a moral panic. It's coming for our children. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, to anticipate a little bit of the conversation, we will return to these subjects when we get to Order of the Phoenix, mm-hmm. where that's the book where we get Fenrir Grey back, right? I believe so. Listeners will tell us if we're wrong. Yeah, tell us if we're wrong. But it's definitely where we get more Lupin and and Tonks. Mm -hmm. And we get this sort of image of like Lupin as somebody who, you know, is in this romantic relationship and is is fearful and hesitant because of his worry about being a werewolf. Mm -hmm. And so the closest we get to an image of destigmatization is one in which the dangerous infected other is accepted back into (gasps) quote unquote normal society oh god so (laughs) so he can be a good werewolf because he is accepted by people who are not werewolves right it makes him sort of by proximity okay Mm -hmm. less dangerous normal Mm -hmm. um these are all words i'm putting in scare quotes Yeah. yeah that is a sort of a recurring cultural trope And that is profoundly at odds with the actual way that movement work operates, which is to say 
stigma against HIV and AIDS does not get reduced because people not living with HIV and AIDS decide to be more tolerant. Mm -hmm. It gets reduced because those communities do decades and decades of vital, urgent, dangerous, transformative work Mm -hmm. to create community supports, to educate, to push politicians, to change policies and laws. Like, Mm -hmm. this work comes out of these communities. And so a deliberate erasure of those communities, right? Mm -hmm. The sort of taking of that individual and completely isolating them from that community Mm -hmm. totally reproduces the idea that social change happens when we, when the us, Mm -hmm. becomes more tolerant and inclusive, Mm -hmm. rather than social change happening when marginalized communities fight so fucking hard for it. Yeah. And it's a matter of one token representation of... Yep. Token member of the marginalized community seemingly... Not seamlessly, but still incorporated into this, like, dominant, heteronormative, white, cis-centric society. Like, that's that's supposed to be the marker of progress. And... Yep. Uh, yeah, I... Okay. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Listen. I'm we, listening. We talked, we talked with Taya about the difficulty of obtaining Wolfsbane potion mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the fact that it didn't make sense that this treatment that would actually make werewolves not a danger to society wasn't more readily available. And mm-hmm. this remains infuriatingly apt to this conversation because it is literally just the stigma that yeah. prevents this kind of access to medication or access to treatment. What is implicit in the denial or the withholding of treatment is the assumption or the belief that, well, if the treatment were available to everybody, then everybody Mm. would engage in deviant behavior. Yep. And again, sorry, I know I'm like talking in circles, but this, but this, this ideology is what is reproduced when we have our one good token representative of the marginalized community, like really working to maintain the structure of the dominant community instead of like, agitating for change or instead of like represented as being part of a community actively seeking rights and yeah i'm so tired it <laughs> makes me feel tired and 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 mad and sad and i laugh when i'm mad and sad in public because feelings are scary i also laugh when i am mad and sad but i i, I think we are pulling out something here that we have touched on in some of our other conversations that feels like it is simultaneously like one of the most crucial things that's coming out of the conversations we're having in this podcast. It feels like a thing that is both like, oh, hey, like here we we are we are realizing something. And that realization feels like banal and obvious. And that is the way that this series that has been celebrated as radical, transformative, Pro- progressive, you know, progressive as advocating for social change that that is very frequently used by scholars who want to prove that books make us better mm-hmm. by like having people like testing people for like you know their feelings about like minoritized others and then having them read Harry Potter and then testing them again and seeing if they're less racist after they read the books Mm -hmm. like these are books that people go to to try to make the point Mm -hmm. that books make us better and this celebrated progressive series is at its heart structurally deeply reactionary Mm. deeply invested 
in a maintenance of the status quo Mm -hmm. and at every stage deeply resistant to the idea of structural change Mm -hmm. like i would say you know our particular subsection of the fandom Mm -hmm. the sort of queer feminist the cool queers (laughs) the cool (laughs) the points the points where we feel drawn into the text are often like those weird gaps Mm -hmm. right those textual gaps those those irreconcilable moments those moments of excess Mm -hmm. that hint at something else at some other possibility right and so we're drawn to those sort of queer slippages Mm -hmm. and to those unanswered questions and to all of these sort of moments where where other possibilities suggest themselves Mm -hmm. and they are shunted back out again right they are consistently refused but they're there Mm -hmm. and i think those become for us were for many of us these sort of entry points that understanding of the way that that a text that is ultimately so invested in the conventional, but that has these moments of queer slippage, Mm -hmm. right? You know, we have this beautiful character in the form of Lupin who is, yes, saddled with this terrible stigmatizing metaphor, but who also sort of can be read in other ways and has been read in other ways by the fandom. You know, for a lot of fans claim him as a queer character. And, mm. you know, we'll we'll have to come back to that when we talk about his relationship with Tonks because that is complex in its own right. And mm-hmm. there's a lot to unpack about Tonks and Lupin and gender and sexuality. And it's too much, too much for this episode. But, mm-hmm. but Lupin is this figure who is often read as queer and who and who offers this sort of you know this this glimpse of possibility for a lot of readers Mm -hmm. and what keeps us coming back to these books even in the midst of reckoning with their and their author's failures i think that's really really graciously put Hannah. I think like <laughs> I think a lot of us have been struggling with our relationships to the books and it is really really important to hear that we weren't mistaken when we first like saw ourselves or found like hope or excitement in the texts that there are irrespective of the politics of the author irrespective of the politics of the publishing industry or children's literature as a discipline, there are slippages. There are points where, not unlike real life, (laughs) there are cracks in the foundation of cis heteropatriarchy. I'm sure I'm forgetting some. You know what I mean? And that's... Yeah. That's white supremacist cis heteropatriarchy. That's the one. And that's where we grow our tiny little roots. Yeah. We just stick our little we just stick our little roots into the cracks in the foundation. Our little dandelions <laughs> pop out. Our yep. beautiful, bright dandelions. And people call them weeds, but yeah. you know what? They spread. Yeah. They yeah. spread. And you know what that is, Marcel? Mm-hmm. What? That's a metaphor. <gasps> Thank you, witches, for joining us for episode 18 of Witch, Please. You can find the rest of our episodes by heading over to notsorryproductions.com or awitchplease.ca or, of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Witch, Please is produced in partnership with Not Sorry Productions and distributed by Acast. Special thanks and a fond farewell and bon voyage to our endlessly patient producer, our ghost in the machine, who is passing the torch on to a new and wonderful producer, and we wish them all the very best. Mm, we love you. We love you. Farewell. And of course, to Not Sorry Productions for having us. If you're into the podcast, why don't you let us know by dropping a review on Apple Podcasts? 
at the end of every episode, we'll shout out, and by we, I mean Marcel, Mm -hmm. we'll shout out (laughs) everyone who left us a five-star review. So you've got to review us if you want to hear Marcel gradually devolve into just making noises. Thank you this week to Wanduk. Calm your tits and make a man a sandwich. Oh, I don't like that. Did we get a five star review from somebody who we got a we got a we got a very very nice five star review, and I don't know if that name is ironic I'm, I'm, or if it's just a surprise misogynist who loves our podcast. Either the name is ironic or the <laughs> review is ironic. But well, sandwich man, thank you. And thank you to Gender Studies Professor, Bumbly Boar. Fuck, I love that. Oh, my God. Um, Elaine, Elaine X, or Elaine Lane X. Uh, cup of, cup of, okay. So it could be cup of G, like cup of tea, but it could also be cup of Gia. Octopus Queen PhD. Love that, too. Um, Addy 486, Sparbtastic, uh, One Candace, and Conductor Kristen. Bless all of you. <laughs> if you want to hear even more from us, don't forget to head over to patreon.com slash witch please to check out the many exciting forms of bonus content available to you. Q&As and interviews and watch-alongs. Ooh. Oh my. So much juicy content. (laughs) On our next episode, we're continuing our discussion of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban with a whole new focus. But until then... Later, witches.